Chapter Five of the Bells of San Juan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bells of San Juan by Jackson Gregory. Chapter Five, in the darkness of the patio, through the silence of the outer night, as though actually Ignacio Chavez were prophesying, came billowing the slow beating of the deep morning bell. Mrs. Engle sighed. Engle frowned. Virginia sat rigid, at once disturbed and oppressed. How can you stand that terrible bell? cried softly. I should think it would drive you mad. How long does he ring it? Once every hour until midnight, answered Engle, his face once more placid as he withdrew his look from the patio and transferred it to his cigar. And then, with a half-smile, there are many San Juans, there is, in all the wide world, but one San Juan of the Bells. You would not take our distinction from us. Now that you are to become of San Juan, you must. Like the rest of us, take a pride in San Juan's bells, which you will do soon or late, perhaps just as soon as you come to know something of their separate and collective histories. Tell her, John, suggested Mrs. Engle again, obviously anxious to dispel the more lugubrious and tragic atmospheres of the evening with any chance talk which might offer itself. Oh, let her wait until Ignacio can tell her, laughed Engle. No one else can tell it so well, and certainly no one else has an equal pride or even an equal right in the matter. But though he refused to take up the colorful theme of the biographies of the captain, the dancer, Lolita, and the rest, John Engle began to speak lightly upon an associated topic, first asking the girl if she knew with what ceremony the old western bells had been cast. When she shook her head, and while the slow, throbbing beat of the captain still insisted through the night silences, he explained that doubtless all six of Ignacio Chavez's bells had taken form under the calm gaze of high priests of old Spain, for legend had it that all six were from their beginnings destined for the new missions to be scattered broadcast throughout a new land, to ring out word of God to heathen ears. Bells meant for such high service were never cast without grave religious service and sacrifice. Through the darkness of long dead centuries, the girl's stimulated fancies followed the man's words. She visualized the great glowing cauldrons in which the fusing metals grew red and an intolerable white, saw men and women draw near proud, blue-blooded grandes on one hand and the lowly on the other with one thought saw the maidens and ladies from the countryside of the king's palace as they removed golden bracelets and necklaces from white arms and throats, so that the red and yellow gold might go with their prayers into the molten metals, enriching them, while those whose poverty was great, but whose devotion was greater, offered what little silver ornaments they could, carved silver vases, golden cups, minted coins, and cherished ornaments, all were offered generously and devoutly, until the blazing cauldrons had mingled the queen's girdle clasps with a bauble from the beggar girl. And in the end, smiled Engle, there are no bells with the sweet tone of old mission bells, or with their soft eloquence. While he was talking, Ignacio Chavez had allowed the dangling rope to slip from his hands so that the captain rested quiet in the starshine. Roderick and Florence were coming in through the wide patio door. Norman was just saying that Flory had promised to play something for him when the front door knocker announced another visitor. Florence made a little disdainful face as though she guessed who it was. Engle went to the door. Even Virginia Page in this land of strangers knew who the man was, for she had seen enough of him today on the stage across the weary miles of desert to remember him and to dislike him. He was the man whom Galloway and the stage-driver called Doc, the sole representative of the medical fraternity in San Juan until her coming. She disliked him first vaguely and then with purely feminine instinct, secondly because of an air which he never laid aside of a serene consciousness of self-superiority. He had established himself in what he was pleased to consider a community of nobodies, his inferiors intellectually and culturally. He was of that type of man-animal that lends itself to fairly accurate cataloging at the end of the first five minutes' acquaintance. The most striking of the physical attributes about his person as he entered were his little mustache and neatly trimmed beard and the diamond stick-pin in his tie. 
remove these articles, and it would have been difficult to distinguish him from countless thousands of other inefficient and opinionated individuals. Virginia noted that both Mr. and Mrs. Engle shook hands with him, if not very cordially, at least with good-humored toleration. Pat Florence treated him to a stiff little nod that Roderick Norton, from across the room, greeted him coldly. "'Dr. Patton,' Engle was saying, "'this is our cousin, Virginia Page.' Dr. Patton acknowledged the introduction and sat down, turning to ask how Flory was today. Virginia smiled, sensing a rebuke to herself in his manner today on the stage. She had made it obvious even to him that if she must speak with a stranger, she would vastly prefer the talk of the stage driver than that of Dr. Caleb Patton. When Florence, replying briefly, turned to the piano, Patton addressed Norton. "'What was our good sheriff doing today?' he asked bantingly, as though the subject he chose were the most apt one imaginable for jest. Another man killed in broad daylight, no one to answer for it. Why don't you go get him, Roddy? Norton stared at him steadily and finally said soberly, When a disease has fastened itself upon the body of a community, it takes time to work a cure, Dr. Patton but not much time to let the life out of a man like the chap from Los Palmos. Why, the man who did the shooting couldn't have done a nicer job if he'd been a surgeon. One bullet square through the carotid artery. That leads from the heart to the head, he explained, as though his listeners were children athirst for knowledge, which he and none other could impart. The cerebrum penetrated by a second. What other technical elucidation might have followed was lost in a thunderous crashing of the piano keys, as Florence Engel strove to drown the man's utterance, and succeeded so well that for an instant he sat gaping at her. "'I can't stand that man,' Florence said sharply to Norton, and though the words did not travel across the room, Virginia was surprised that even an individual so completely armored as Caleb Patton could fail to grasp the girl's meaning. When Florence had pounded her way through a noisy bit of jazz, Caleb Patton, with one of his host's cigars lighted, was leaning a little forward in his chair, alert to seize the first opportunity of snatching conversation by the throat. "'Kid Rickard admits killing Bisbee,' he said to Norton. "'What are you going to do about it?' first thing I heard when I got in from a professional call a little while ago was that Rickard was swaggering around town, saying that you wouldn't gather him in because you were afraid to.' Sheriff's face remained unmoved, though the others looked curiously to him and back to Patton, who was easy and complacent and vaguely irritating. "'Imagine you haven't seen Jen Galloway since you got in, have you?' Norton returned quietly. "'No,' said Patton. "'Why? What has Galloway got to do with it?' "'Ask him. He says Rickard killed Bisbee in self-defense.' "'Oh,' said Patton, and then shifting in his chair, Galloway says so, I guess you are right in letting the kid go. And a trifle hasty it struck Virginia, he switched talk into another channel, telling of the case on which he had been out today, enlarging upon its difficulties with which it appeared. He had been eminently fitted to cope. There was an amused twinkle in John Ingalls' eyes as he listened. By the way, Patton, the banker observed when there came a pause, I've got a rival in town, have you heard? "'What do you mean?' asked the physician. "'When I introduced you just now to our cousin Virginia, I should have told you. She is Dr. Page, M.D.' Again Patton said, "'Oh,' but this time in a tone which, through its plain implication, put a sudden flash into Virginia's eyes. As he looked toward her, there was half a sneer upon his lips, which his scanty growth of beard and mustache failed to hide. Had he gone on to say, a lady, doctor, eh? and laughed, the case would not have been altered. It seems so funny for a girl to be a doctor, said Florence, for the first time referring in any way to Virginia since she had flown to the door, expecting Norton alone. Even now she did not look toward her kinswoman. John Ingle replied, speaking crisply. But just what he said Virginia did not know, for suddenly her whole attention was withdrawn from the conversation fixed and held by something moving in the patio. First she had noted a slight change in Rob Norton's eyes, saw them grow keen and watchful, noted that they had turned toward the door opening into the little court where the fountain was, 
where the wall lamp threw its rays wanly among the shrubs and through the grape arbor. He had seen something move out there. From where she sat, she could look the way he looked and mark how a clump of rose bushes had been disturbed and now stood motionless again in the quiet night. Wondering, she looked again to Norton. His eyes told nothing now save that they were keen and watchful. Whether or not he knew what it was so guardedly stirring in the patio, whether he, like herself, had merely seen the gently agitated leaves of the bushes, she could not guess. She started when Engle addressed some trifling remark to her. While she evaded the direct answer, he was fully conscious of the sheriff's eyes steady upon her. He, no doubt, was wondering what she had seen. It was only a moment later when Norton rose and went to Mrs. Engle, telling her briefly that he had had a day of it in the saddle since dawn, wishing her a good night. He shook hands with Engle, nodded to Patton, and coming to Virginia said lightly, but she thought with an almost sternly serious look in his eyes, We're all hoping you like San Juan, Miss Page, and you will too if the desert stillness doesn't get on your nerves. But then silence isn't such a bad thing after all, is it? Good night. She understood his meaning, and though a thrill of excitement ran through her blood, answered laughingly, Shall a woman learn from the desert? Have I been such a chatterbox, Mrs. Engel, that I am to be admonished at the beginning to study, to hold my tongue? Florence looked at her curiously, turned toward Norton, and then went with him to the door. For a moment their voices came in a murmur down the hallway. Then Norton had gone, and Florence returned slowly to the living room. Again, Virginia looked out into the patio. Never a twig stirred now. All was as quiet as the sleeping fountain, as silent and mystery-filled as the desert itself. Had Roderick Norton seen more than she? Did he know who had been out there? Was here the beginning of some further sinister outgrowth of the lawlessness of Kid Rickard, of the animosity of Jim Galloway? Was she presently to see Norton himself slipping into the patio from the other side? Was she again to hear the rattle of pistol shots? He had asked her to say nothing. She had unhesitatingly given him her promise. Had she so unquestionably done as he had requested because he was the sheriff who represented the law or because he was Roderick Norton, who stood for fine, upstanding manhood? Again she felt Florence Engle's eyes fixed upon her. Florence is prepared at the beginning to dislike me, she thought. Why, just because I walked with him from the hotel? In the heat of an argument with Mrs. Engle, there came an interruption. The banker's wife was insisting that Virginia do the only sensible thing in the world, that she accepted a home under the Engle roof, occupying the room already made ready for her. Virginia, warmed by the cordial invitation, while deeply grateful, felt that she had no right to accept. She had come to San Juan to make her own way. She had no claim upon the hospitality of her kinswoman, certainly no such claim as was implied now. Besides, there was Elmer Page. Her brother was coming to join her tomorrow or the next day and as soon as it could be arranged they would take a house all by themselves, or, if that proved impossible, would have a suite at the hotel. At the moment, when it seemed like a deadlock had come between Mrs. Engle's eagerness to mother her cousin's daughter and Virginia's inborn sense of independence, the interruption came. It arrived in the form of a boy of ten or twelve, a ragged, scantily clothed, swarthy youngster, rubbing a great toe against a bare leg, while from the front door he announced that Ignacio Chavez was sick, that he had eaten something muy malo, that he had pains, and that he prayed that the doctor cure him. Patton grunted his disgust. Don't wait, he said briefly, and in explanation to the others, there's nothing the matter with him. I saw him on the street just before I came, and wasn't he ringing the bell not fifteen minutes ago? But the boy had not completed his message. Ignacio was sick and did not wish to die and so had sent him to ask the Miss Lady Doctor to come to him. Virginia rose swiftly. "'You see,' she said to Mrs. Engle, "'what a nuisance it would be if I lived with you. May I come to see you tomorrow?' While she said good night, Engle got his hat. "'I'll go with you,' he said, but like Patton. I don't believe there is much the matter with Chavez. Maybe he thinks he'll get a free drink of whiskey." You see again, laughed Virginia from the doorway, what it would be like, Mrs. Ingle, if every time I had to make a call and Mr. Ingle deemed it necessary to go with me. I'd have to split my fees with him, at the very least, and I don't believe that I could afford to do that. 
You could give me all Ignacio pays you, chuckled Engle, and never miss it. The boy waited for them, and when they came out into the starlight, flitted on ahead of them. At the cottonwoods, a man stepped out to meet them. Hello, said Engle. It's Norton. I sent the boy for Miss Page, said Norton quickly. I had to have a word with her immediately, and I'm glad that you came, Engle. I want a favor of you, a mighty big favor of Miss Page. The boy had passed on through the shadows and now was to be seen on the street. I guess you know you can count on me, Rod, said Engle quietly. What now? I want you, when you go back to the house, to say that you have learned that Miss Page likes horseback riding. Then send a horse for her to the hotel stable, so that if she likes, she can have it in the early morning, and say nothing about my having sent the boy. Engel did not answer immediately. He and Virginia stood trying to see the sheriff's features through the darkness. He had spoken quietly enough, and yet there was an odd new note in his voice. It was easy to imagine how the muscles about his lean jaw had tensed, how his eyes were again the hard eyes of a man who saw his fight before him. I can trust you, John, continued Norton quickly. I can trust Ignacio Chavez. I can trust Julius Thurb. And, if you want it in words of one syllable, I cannot trust Caleb Patton. Hmm, said Engel. I think you're mistaken there, my boy. Maybe, returned Norton. But I can't afford right now to take any unnecessary chances. Further, and in the gloom, they saw his shoulders lifted in a shrug. I am trusting Miss Page because I've got to, which may not sound pretty, but it is the truth. Of course I'll do what you ask, Engel said. Is there anything else? No, just go on with Miss Page to see Ignacio. He will pretend to be doubled up with pain and will tell his story of the tinned meat he ate for supper. Then you can see her to the hotel and go back home, sending the horse over right away. Then she will ride with me to see a man who is hurt. Or she will not, and I'll have to take a chance on Patton. Who is it? demanded Engle sharply. It's Brocky Lane, returned Norton, and again his voice told of rigid muscles and hard eyes. He's hurt bad, John, and if we're to do him any good, we'd better be about it. Engle said nothing, but the slow, deep breath he drew into his lungs could not have been more eloquent of his emotion had it been expelled in a curse. I'll slip around the back way to the hotel, said Norton. I'll be ready when Miss Page comes in. Good night, John. Silently, without awaiting promise or protest from the girl, he was gone into the deeper shadows of the cottonwoods. End of chapter 5